it's a it's a pleasure to be here for this inaugural uh, uh, series, and I, I thought I would uh, make sure the series is a no ties series, so I would start up uh, with, with that. Um, so Alan will have to uh, ex take take that up. Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, Start start by telling you a, a bit about this work that I've been doing in in uh, Sri Lanka with Suresh Damal, who's based at the University of Perindanya in Sri Lanka, and with Chris Woodruff, who's at the University of Warwick. And so, in m most of, most of the talk, I'll focus in on this particular study and and tell you about this this study in uh, the, the, this area of enterprise development in in Sri Lanka. But hopefully, there's some sort of broader lessons for impact evaluation, which I will talk about a little bit at the end as well. So I guess I've got this clicker. Um, so, so just in terms of motivation, though, you know, we know that self-employment is really important for poor people in a lot of developing countries. And on the, on the other hand, it's um, when we look at places like South Asia, uh, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, when we look in the Middle East, there's just a lot of women that don't work at all. And so this is kind of the, our, our motivation going into the study, which is can business training get raise the incomes of all these poor business owners who are already running businesses and can it allow some more women who are outside the labor force to start up um, businesses and perhaps more successful businesses so, so why do we care about business training why are we looking at that well you know the motivation for, for this is is i guess you know people have already done quite a bit on capital and we've done some work ourselves where looking at access to capital as a constraint to female microenterprise growth has sort of given somewhat disappointing results. So as you know, a lot of the impetus on the microfinance movement has been this idea that, uh, as Mohammed Yunus said, you know, people have the skills they need, they just need the capital and you just need to give them some loans and, and their enterprises will, will grow and grow and, and everything will be fine. And sort of both the experiments we've done where we've given grants of capital to, to firms as well as some of the most recent evaluations of microfinance have found it's, it's much more difficult than that. It's, it's, you know, giving capital seems to perhaps have some business, some, some success in getting new businesses started, but has had very little success in getting existing female run businesses to grow, especially the subsistence businesses. So we have some work in Ghana with sort of higher end businesses where um, pushing some capital into those, those businesses has had some success. But for the subsistence dollar a day type businesses, it just seems really challenging for a capital alone to work. And so this is where we think, well, you know, maybe we just need to, they, to give people a bit more skills. So what do we do? We conduct a randomized experiment in Sri Lanka to test the impact of business training on two different groups of women. So we have a group who are self-employed with low levels of income. So these are your typical subsistence businesses. And then we have another group, which is um, sort of less studied, I guess, in, in looking at this, which is women who are out of the labor force and thinking they might li like to, to enter. And you know, can we offer training to them and get them to enter? So I'll, I'll talk in a, a few moments about the existing literature on business training experiments. But the program that we're going to use here is, is the sort of one that's used most commonly worldwide. It's the ILO's Start and Improve Your Business Training Program, which is used in 95 countries around the world. They, you know, come up with some numbers of, you know, s several million people that have used this training program. So it's kind of a, an important program to know whether it's actually doing anything or not. It's not some, you know, program that that's someone like me has just sat down and invented and, and uh, um, given to a few microfinance clients. It's, it's something that's, that's been used in a lot of places. So we're going to look at the impact of the training alone, as well as training plus grants. I should say, by the way, I'm happy to take clarifying questions through. I know we've got a formal discussant in Alan, and we'll, have, we'll make sure we leave um, plenty of time for discussion at the end. But if, if I'm saying something that you want to just have clarified as I go through, just let me know. OK, and then we're going to um, measure outcomes at four points in time post-training. And so this is one of the things that we'll come back to at the end. But I think it's quite important for studies like this that we measure the trajectory of impacts. And we don't just kind of do a one-off snapshot sometime after we've done our intervention and say, you know, this is the impact of our program. You'll see that the impacts vary quite a lot depending on when we look. OK, so, um, so, the, so this was sort of a, a program we launched in, in 2009. And at the time, there was sort of this Carlin and Valdivia study and, and not much else. And, and sort of it's been this, um, some, one of these things that happens where a lot of people suddenly started doing uh, business training program evaluations all at the same time, which is, which is uh, nice. We're starting to get you know, a range of them in different circumstances so we can start drawing some common lessons. And so that's on my summer agenda is to, to try and uh, 
critique these, these studies and put together something that, that brings them all together. Um, but if you look at them, what, what they've ex most of the existing studies have done is work with microfinance um, clients. So they work with NGOs or microfinance organizations to offer business training to some of their clients. They focus on existing business owners, people who are already running businesses typically. The, the programs are often customized, designed by, by those NGOs. There's some, they, they've got a lot of commonalities to the training program here, but they're not necessarily the off-the-shelf um, you know, programs that have been used in a, in a lot of places. And they typically just do a single snapshot follow-up. And so I've got a range of these studies up here. Uh, the sort of generalized picture from these studies, which, as I say, have all been with existing business owners, is that you know, typically we're quite good at getting people to do some of the things that business training programs try and get them to do. So you tell them to keep some records, they keep some records. You tell them to do a bit more advertising, they do a bit more advertising. But then it's really hard to actually detect any impacts of that on the business performance. And so you know, especially for, for these uh, um, studies with, with female business owners, there's really been very little that's found much impact on business performance. Maybe on sales and bad periods, there's a couple of studies that suggest you can perhaps you know, get them to do a little bit better when things are bad, but on average, it's that these studies haven't found too much. So uh, just to give you the context of, of our intervention, we we're looking at, at Sri Lanka, where urban labor force participation rates for women are just very low. So for a 20 to 40 year old woman, only 38% are working versus over 90% of men. So this is like a lot of South Asia in the Middle East where there's just many women aren't working at all. Of those that do work, 28% uh, are, are self-employed, but most of the self-employed are not earning very much. So the, the median profits is sort of just over a dollar a day, $43 a month. Only 5% of these, these firms have any paid workers, so most of them are just sole proprietors running their little shops. Yeah? Um, when you I mean paid work. So um, if you're doing unpaid work in family businesses, that's not counted here, but if you're um, a wage worker, you're a self-employed, um, you, you know, this, this is not necessarily formal work. Okay, so, um, so, so obviously one of the issues with, with starting to do this and thinking of a, a group that's not microfinance clients is who do you offer this training to in the first place? And so we wanted to try and get more representative samples of, of business owners and potential business owners than you might get of, of the people who have already been selected and into microfinance organizations. And so what we did was we identified uh, two groups of women that we're interested in women who are already running subsistence businesses and women who might be interested in, in starting a business. And then we did a door-to-door -door household listing in uh, 10 DS, which are district secretariat districts around uh, Colombo and Candy. We went to 142 GNs, which you can think of as like census tracts. And so we went door-to-door -to, -door, um, to, to identify which households had businesses, which households had people who, who were potentially interested in businesses. And these are the criteria we set up. We, had, we asked for people who are 25 to 45 years old. Um, and then for the current businesses, we wanted them to be working full time in this, not to be doing seasonal activities where you know, they're, they're only doing it for part of the year. And we wanted to focus in on these subsistence businesses. So we, we chose businesses where they were earning less than uh, what we'd found as the median profits to be for, for this sector. For the potential enterprises, this is sort of a more interesting issue of you know who's going to be a potential business owner and we we were deadly afraid that we wouldn't find that we'd sort of select a group where nobody ended up starting a business we're actually um ended up a, a lot more successfully than that and you'll see in our control group about half of them end up starting a business over the period of our study so you know the screening criteria worked quite um well so we look at people who say to us when we say you know are you planning on entering the labor force in the next year they say yeah i'm you know interested in in doing that they they can give you a little bit of specifics they've started thinking about what type of business they might um want to do and then we were are afraid that people who had young children to look after just might not be able to enter the labor force if they had you know a two-year-old or, or um, a baby and so we said you know either you had to have your kids over five years of age, or you had to have somebody who could look after them. And so we used those screening criteria. And so given that, we, we took these samples of 628 current enterprises and 628 potential enterprises, and we equally d distributed them across these 10 district secretariat divisions because we wanted to make sure we had sort of equal numbers coming to training um, to our different training locations. And so um, we, we spread them out like that. 
So who are we talking about here? Our typical current enterprise owners are the people running you know, the stores you see everywhere, the tea shops, your beauty shops, your you know, small scale manufacturing of mats or, or um, tailoring, things like that. Typical woman in our sample is 36 years old, married, has 10 years of education. So this is you know, an important thing in the Sri Lankan context. The education levels are typically a lot higher than in many um, other developing countries for the levels of income people are, are earning. Um, so, you know, despite, despite these levels of education, people are earning, um, as I say, given that we've selected them on earning less than, than 5,000 rupees, the median is, is 4,000 rupees. They're contributing about a quarter of their household's income on average, okay? So this is, they're not the sole owners of their household. They typically have um, husbands or other household members who are contributing money to their household as well. And uh, when we look, we, we have this measure of business practices, which are the types of things the ILO's training is trying to teach you. And so we sort of enumerate 29 practices that they would be trying to teach you, and, and the median business or the mean business is only doing four of those at the start. Okay, so most businesses are not keeping written records, they're not um, doing advertising, they're not having sales targets, etc. And very few of them have done any business related training before, and if they have, it's, it's been technical training. So here's our you know, typical types of businesses, right? The, the, um, the grocery store, a little hair salon, things like this. So our typical potential business owners are, um, most of them have worked before, but very few of them have been self-employed before. They, they've taken some concrete steps on average towards opening a business. They're a little bit younger than the current but, um, group, but otherwise they're very similar in terms of education levels. They're, um, sort of ability levels as measured by digit span recall tests or Raven tests or things like that. Um, their households are a little bit poorer because they're not contributing money to their households. Um, and they're, they're less likely to have things like fridges or sewing machines or assets that could be used for both business or household uses. So then we randomly selected 400 out of um, the 628 in each group to be invited to training. And then half of those who are invited to training would get a grant conditional on completing training. But we didn't want there to be different selection where, you know, I might take up training if I, can, if I know I'm going to get money at the end, but I wouldn't take up training if I don't. So we just told people that half of the ones who completed training would get it, but they wouldn't find out whether they were the ones or not um, until, until they completed training. So that way we, we get the same take up rates across the, treatment, the, the two different tr treatment groups, but one group in, in additional to the training gets capital. So our randomization, we stratified on these, these district secretariats where our locations of these training programs were going to be, and then on other key variables that we thought um, might predict what's going to go on in the business. And so we get this um, randomized allocation across treatment and control. We get balance on based on characteristics, and then we implement the training. And so the training is this ILO training program. It was designed, um, you know, back in the 70s, it came out of... Um, it, it, it it's, was started in East Africa, and now they, they estimate a global outreach of 1.5 million trainees, 95 countries, and they have three main programs they ha that we use. The Generate Your Business program, which is a three-day program to generate an idea for your business. And once you've got your idea, the Start Your Business program, which is, you know, how do you set up a business? How do you s sell? How do you price things? How do you organize your staff? If you don't have any staff, that's not such a, a big module, obviously. Um, how do you decide which equipment and inputs you need? Uh, the, you know, whether you set your business up legally um, in, and how to register if you want to do so, etc. And then for businesses where it's existing and they want to push a bit further, they have this Improve Your Business program, which is a five-day course that, that focuses on marketing, buying, cost control, record keeping, financial planning, things like this. So, so these are very similar types of content to those other studies that I've told you. It's, it's sort of basically you know, uh, getting, getting businesses growing and, and uh, trying, trying to improve what they're doing. So our, our potential group got the three-day generate a business idea program and then followed that by the five-day start your, your business program. Our currents got a one-day refresher, generate your business program. So the idea was, well, they're already running a business, but maybe they can start thinking about new products and things by a one-day refresher. And then they get this five-day improve your business program. And then on top of that, both, days got, both groups got one day of technical training where um, we had exposure to you know, relatively high return sectors. So we had um, things like beauty shops or um, baking, which seem to do better for women than, than making cooking food. So if you're baking a cake, you would 
earn a lot more money than if you're just cooking lunch packets to give to everybody. For example, if you're wanting to get into hairdressing, we had some vendors come along and tell you, you know, this is some of the, the products and things. So um, that was, that was uh, um, just at the end of it. Now the training here was provided by the ILO licensed local provider of this training program who'd had eight years of experience delivering this content in Sri Lanka and all their trainers were, uh, were university educated trainers, they've all been certified. So this is not a case where we're trying out something that's a brand new program where you might think the trainers are of uncertain quality and they haven't got used to the material yet and they haven't got experience and so if you don't find effects it's because you know it's, a, it's this new thing that people don't really know how to deal with yet. It's something that they've, they've had a lot of experience doing. Now the cost of training to us was about $130 per individual train, so that's what we paid um, this training provider. We offered it for free to the participants. So we, again, we were interested in seeing for the average um, business what would happen to them if they got training. We were influenced a bit here by Dean Carlin's work in Peru where they found that you know, potential benefits were highest for the people that were less interested in training to begin with. So um, you know, we, were, we wanted to make sure we could get as many people into training as possible. And so we offered it for free, and we also gave them a little transport subsidy. So you know, you do your training, get this nice certificate saying you've done this um, certificate. You you go and do this training. Uh, nice thing about being in Sri Lanka, you get your palm trees and your uh, nice training location there. Um, and so we had reasonably high take up for the this treatment. I think this is. Uh, given that these aren't microfinance clients who are sort of compelled to come along because it's been offered by the same people that are giving them money and um, ha have sort of twisted their arms to go, we got, had about 70% of um, both groups attend training. And uh, most people who turned up completed the training. So it wasn't the case they went to one day and they thought this is boring, they won't go. Conditional on us getting them there for a day, almost everybody who, who showed up um, continued on in the training. So we find a little bit of difference in, in take up. So um, take up is, is less in Colombo. It seems like the opportunity cost of time matters um, for the current firms that people who are more profitable, who work more hours, who have more wealth, just find it harder to get away from their businesses perhaps, or you know, alternatively they just see, think that they're doing well enough and they, they see less benefit for doing this. And you know, we, we find um, a bit you know, a bit of selective take up on education for the current businesses, but not for the potential businesses. So then here's the timeline of our study. Uh, this is a bit small, I, ap I apologize. We, we did a baseline in January 2009. We did the training a couple of months later, and then we have four rounds of follow-up surveys. So we have a follow-up survey four months after training, a second one eight months after training, a third one um, 16 months after training, and a fourth one 25 months after training. So we're able to trace out through these follow-up surveys the trajectory of, of what happens to these businesses. Okay, so um, the attrition rates here were, were very low. Uh, you know, typically attrition of, of 6 to 8% in, in any particular round, and the attrition is unrelated to treatment status. It, um, you know, our results don't seem to be um, driven by uh, the attrition at all. And then what we do is we measure business outcomes, so what's going on with the, the businesses, their profits, their sales, their capital stock, uh, their business practices, what are they doing, are they employing the things that the training did. So I, um, I'll be very brief here, there's a little theory model in the paper to think about how we might think business training could affect these firms, but if you think about you know, people deciding whether to um, engage in business training or, I, I mean sorry, to engage in, in wage work versus self-employment, I've got this little graph here where, uh, um, you know, if you think about ability and wealth, then the people that are going to become self-employed are the people that have high wealth um, given their, their ability or high ability given their wealth or high levels of both. If you're, um, if you're poor and stupid, you're going to um, not go into um, business. If you're rich and, and uh, not very able, then you, you, you know, even if you could afford to set up a business, uh, you'd be better off doing wage work. And so I put wage work here, but this could be wage work or working in, in the home. So then what do we think business training might do here? Well, what business training might do is, is re um, reduce the, the, the sort of skill level that you would need to be able to start up your business in the absence of business training. So if theta is kind of your innate ability, then what we're going to do is, is mean that people who now have theta minus T, where T is the effect of the training, are able to you know, now into the business, and so we have a bunch of people who are kind of less skilled than the average person in business entering, or 
conditional on their skill, a bunch of people that are poorer than the people that are already in business. So we should be sort of driving into business people who are either less able or poor um, than, they, than the people who would have started up businesses otherwise. Um, so that's, that's kind of what this little theory, theory says, and that's what you'll see will happen. So now we'll look at impacts. What does this do on current businesses? What does it do on these potential businesses? So you know, as I mentioned, you know, all the studies to date have found when you do this on current businesses, you get them to do some of the things that you ask them to do. So if you tell them to keep records and to do some advertising and to do some financial planning, then they tell you at least that they're doing these things and you, know, you can test them in various ways and it seems like they are doing a little bit of things. And so um, you, know, you, you see even our, you see this is, this is potentially the risk of asking, you know, once you tell, ask people in baseline whether they're doing these things, even the control group seems to be doing more of them um, than, than the next time. And so this is sort of a, you know, if I, if I start pressing you in a baseline interview about, you know, have you done any of these following things in the last 30 days for your business, you might start thinking, no, I haven't, and maybe I should start doing those. And so, you know, you get a little bit of that, but we get a bigger boost for the, the ones that have gone through training. You can see it's very similar for the, the training and the training only. So, so their business practices improve, but what happens to profits? Um, so here's the, the training only and the control group of these two lines here, and you can see uh, the control group of anything is actually slightly less than the, uh, is, the control groups of, of anything slightly above the um, training only group in, in some rounds. The cash group, we get this initial big boost where their, their profits are higher than the other two groups, but then it starts closing over time. And uh, you know we'll see this is, this this gap is very small and insignificant by the by the last round. Yeah. So then what, what's that? So so this no this this is the profits from the from from the business activities. So we'll look at you know the cash goes into capital stock and then that capital stock generates more profits. So if they eat that eat that cash, that cash is not counted as profits. Okay. Um, so another way of just seeing whether this is getting driven by strange parts in the distribution, this is the cumulative density function. Uh, um, so you know, the way to read this is, of course, 40% um, of people have profits below this line. So this is four months after training. What we see is you know, these, these, these distributions look pretty similar, but then at the top separate, you know, for the, about the top half of the distribution, the, the density for the um, cash plus training group has shifted to the right compared to the other two groups. So this, you know, it's not getting driven by just a couple of outliers here. It does seem that there's something going on where the, the cash plus training group is getting higher profits in the short run. But then when we look 25 months after the, the training and grant, the, you know, these distributions are just completely collapsed on one another. There's just nothing going on here. So, um, you know, this is way too many numbers for a presentation, but um, just to... to to you know, show what I've shown graphically. So here's, you know, the profits are kind of higher for the cash plus plus training group initially, and then they start collapsing in the in the later rounds. Um, whereas the training only group, we just see nothing going on. If we look at sales, training only group is getting nothing. If we look at capital stock, they're not investing any more capital stock. You see the the people that got the cash have more capital stock. Um, we don't see much going on in, in, uh, in sales. Again, maybe there's a boost to the start, and then these levels are higher, but not, there's a lot of noise, and they're not significantly so. So, you know, the, so we're, we're getting kind of a similar story to, to the existing programs there that for the current businesses, training alone just doesn't seem to do anything um, for them. If we combine it with the grant, we get the short-term boost, but that seems to have gone away. So a bit disheartening. Let's have a look at the potential businesses, yeah? Um, to, so, so um, that's a useful question. The, I guess two reasons for that. One is, uh, so the, yeah, sorry. The, the question was why we didn't have a cash-only group. Um, so, or, or, and so uh, the re one reason for that was we'd already done experiments in Sri Lanka where we'd given cash only. The second reason is our cash is only conditional on completing business training. And so we'd need to be able to figure out which people in the control group would complete training if they were offered training. And so that we didn't feel like we could figure that out. And so if we gave cash to all the control group, that wouldn't be comparable to the cash plus training group. Um, but you know, when we gave cash only, we found nothing in Sri Lanka to, to, to these businesses. Okay, so what about the, the potential business owners? So here, 
In the short run, we get this huge increase in business entry. Um, so if we give, you know, training alone has, has, has a bit of an increase and training plus cash has more of an increase. But then, you know, what seems to have happened is we've pretty much just taken people up to this 60% this level and then they, they stagnate there. So we've sort of pushed people into business faster. But if by the time you start looking at our, our last surveys, these groups are all similar. So, um, you know, if we look at these, these impacts, there's a 29 percentage point increase um, for those who got tr training and cash in their rate of business um, ownership by round two, but by round four and round five, it's, it's fallen to 2% and not significant. If you look for the training only, it's 12 percentage points at round two, but it's minus two percentage points at, by round five and not significant. So we've sped up um, entry, and so if you were just to look in the first year, like a lot of these business training program evaluations do, it would seem like this had been incredibly successful at generating new business startups. But by 25 months, if we keep on um, following these people, we can see that that impact's gone away on levels. There's just, just, just no impact. So what about who runs a business? You know, our model that I um, put up suggests that there should be some differences in the selection of who's starting businesses after this training. So here's a, a graph which doesn't look as nice as I like because I haven't figured out how to get rid of these little lines yet. Um, but um, what this is doing is, is showing lowest lines of the pr probability of um, operating a business by round five against your baseline Raven test scores. So the Raven test is this um, test of, of uh, non-verbal IQ, or it's, it's a measure of analytical ability. You give people 12 um, puzzles where they have to kind of figure out which goes in the pattern. And so higher levels of this indicate more um, sort of analytical reasoning. And so we see here in the control group that there's this sharp upward slope here, that you're more likely to open a business if you're higher ability. Okay, what we've done with the two treatments is we've leveled that off. And so this is what you know, we've brought in um, here. We've brought in lower ability people into opening businesses who, who would have otherwise not opened businesses. But we also seem to have driven out some of the higher ability people. Okay, so this is a great success, right? We've uh, <laughs> managed to, to get uh, low ability people to open businesses and the high ability people have kind of realized, hey, after doing this training businesses, uh, running a business is more difficult than I thought perhaps. I, I, it's, it's not something for me. When we look at wealth, um, you know, so when we look at wealth, the ones who, who just got the training look pretty similar to the control group where, you know, there's, it's pretty flat and then there's an upward sloping bet. So, um, again, some of the richer people are more likely to open it. What we've done is we've driven, a bun driven into opening a business a bunch of the poor people by giving them grants. And again, we seem to have driven out some of the rich people. So, um, you know, we've given them some money and they've decided I don't need to open a business after all. Okay, so, um, so th this makes it tricky for looking at what it does to these businesses, right? So we've, by, by the time we get to round five, we have the same level um, effects on business ownership, but the characteristics who, who, of whom opened the business are a little bit different. So we can't just r rely on our naive experimental comparisons because now even though the experiment randomized people into the training, the people who have started up businesses are selected differently across them. So you know, what, will, what will we do? Well, well, we will do these naive experimental approaches because you know, there's, any selection seems to be negative selection, right? It's, it's poorer and less able people who have gone into businesses as a result of the training. So to the extent that that's um, what's going on, any estimates we get of the training effect should be lower bounds, you know, where the selection should be kind of giving us uh, a lower bound there. And then secondly, we use a generalized propensity score method where we um, sort of estimate the prob probability of running a business as a proportion of baseline characteristics and reweight things so that our groups look more comparable. And so, you know, what do we get here? Um, if we, let's look first at total work income, which is important to look at because it includes both income from wage work and income from running a business. And so the, the advantage of this is we can just rely on the pure experiment because there's, there's no selection going on here. And so what we see is in the short run, there's actually very little in, increase in, in total work income and what's going on is that while we've pushed people into opening businesses faster, that's coming at a cost of them not being in wage work. Okay, and so um, if you look, um, so this is going to complicate your, your uh, comments, Alan, it, um, is, is that uh, um, if you look at just the increase in profits that, that come in the short run from um, opening a business more, more quickly, 
um, it, the, you know, we're not taking account any loss in wage income. So here, if we look here, their, their total work income is, is um, marginally higher if, if they got the training only. We can't reject these two things are the same, but it doesn't seem like there's any additional benefit from getting the cash on top of the trainings for, for sure. Um, if we look at the business profits by, by round four and five, these businesses that got the training um, only are more profitable even though they're negatively selected. So the training does seem to have helped these businesses um, who, that get started up be more profitable. And we see it, um, when we do the reweighting, it doesn't make that much difference here. So this is, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like, given that we randomized to start with, the selection is actually pretty small. Okay, so um, I'm going to conclude and then we'll, we'll turn over to Alan. So, you know, what, what we sort of take from this is it doesn't seem like training alone is enough to get these subsistence businesses that are already in existence to, to grow. It's consistent with these other studies and it's consistent with works on the return to capital. Just adding, adding capital on top of the training gives this temporary boost, but it seems to go away. It just seems really hard to get these subsistence businesses run by women to grow. Um, so, you know, what do we take from that for, for policy? I guess... You know, one option is just to say, well, you didn't do a good enough job. You need to train them a lot more um, intensively. And so that's the approach that um, some studies have taken, where you now go and follow up this classroom training with one-on-one -on -one mentoring and have hours and hours of consultant time. So Martin Valdivia has a study on that in Peru and does find some impacts in the business. But this is, of course, enormously expensive and very difficult to get to pay for itself. You know, so the, then I guess the other, ish, other option is to address the constraints in, to participation in the wage market. That is the reason why a lot of these women are opening up businesses in the first place, which is just, you know, they, have a, they, like, they need flexibility so they can take care of family things and there's no good childcare. They need to be able to, they want to go into um, wage work, but there's social or cultural constraints on particular types of wage work. Um, so there's all these other constraints that, that mean women are opening businesses who ideally, you know, would, would not be running businesses in the first place. You know, the results are a lot more encouraging for the ability of, of these training programs to help women who want to start businesses help start them more quickly and, and potentially make these businesses that are started more profitable. And this is a group that these existing business training studies, um, as far as I'm aware, have not really focused in on or not. They're looking at microfinance clients. A few of those clients have not started businesses already, but most of them are already um, have started businesses. And this is consistent also with, if you look at the recent randomized studies in Mongolia and India of, of microfinance, they sort of find that they're, they're getting some impacts on, on business startups, even though they're not finding much on the profitability and, and sales and things of those businesses. So it's kind of easier to get people to start up subsistence businesses than it is to get these businesses to grow. And, you know, there's always then this question, do we want to get more people starting up subsistence businesses? Well, you know, at least their work income seems to be a bit higher. They, these on an individual level, these people seem to be doing better off as a result of this. So my final slide is just, you know, given that this is the uh, a seminar for, for impact evaluation, just some of the sort of broader lessons perhaps or, or um, issues here for impact evaluation. So one is that these results show the importance of tracing out the trajectory of impacts. So if we just had done our follow-up survey at eight months or a year, we would have thought that the, the training had quite different effects than if if we are able to trace out this trajectory. For example, we would have you know, really overstated how much we'd, we'd generated new employment as a result of the training for potential business owners. Second thing to here is, is the importance of looking at impacts on different subgroups of interest. So you know, all these existing studies which really look at microfinance clients, um, you know, that's, that's an important group and it's a useful group, but you know, maybe this training program works types of training programs work much better for certain types of individuals than others. And maybe, you know, as we see here, it, it, it's just much easier to get these programs to work to people who are kind of at that critical decision of whether I start a new business or not than people who have already been doing the same thing for a while and they much get harder to change behavior. You know, arguably from a theory point of view too, we're going to learn a lot more about firm constraints if we start with a broader sample of the population and, and um, look at the impact of training for them than if we look at this group that we, we have no idea who it represents. And then the final thing when we're trying to compare these evaluations and, you know, put our study in context with the others is this, you know, a lot of these interventions now become, you know, when we're trying to compare one business training intervention with another, there's just so much heterogeneity in what business training is. And I'm finding the same thing with 
financial literacy interventions as well. It's just, you know, it, it's not the same as, as uh, a CCT where, you know, there's variation in the cash, but everybody's getting cash and maybe there's a little bit of variation in the, the conditions, but every, you know, it's a pretty similar program. Here, there's a lot of difference in the intensity of the training and the curricula and the, you know, who's doing the training and, and et cetera, that makes it um, a lot harder to, to compare across studies and to draw general lessons from this. And so I will leave it there. Thanks.